splitting of Berlin uh, was part of the larger strategy of the British to keep the Americans out of China, and it has succeeded. Greetings, this is Eugene the Philosopher, the greatest living philosopher after the unfortunate passing of Quentin Robert de Nameland, who has been the greatest living philosopher before me. Let's talk about Berlin and its status after the World War II. Like, in particular, why was it split so weirdly, basically sitting in the middle of the Soviet occupation zone, whereas, you know, the West Berlin was controlled by the Allies, right? So, uh, after the World War II, Berlin became a problem exactly because of that, because it was split between the Allies, that is the Americans, the British and the French, and the Soviets, while the city itself was deep within the Soviet territory. So essentially, West Berlin became an Allied enclave, or enclave, surrounded by the Soviets, right? And this problem has resurfaced later on, uh, during the Berlin blockade of 1948 to 1949, for example, or the Berlin crisis, so-called, the Berlin crisis of 1961. So why did it became a problem in the first place? Like, why was it split so weirdly? And who needed this? And what was the purpose of this uh, in the first place? So from the military perspective, like having West Berlin is completely useless for the Allies, uh, which is obvious. I mean, it's, it's literally a trap for any uh, forces that are uh, like quartered there, like situated there, right? Because you're literally surrounded from all sides by the enemy, by the Soviets. Uh, then uh, from the propagandist point of view, uh, you might say, well, uh, the West uh, wanted like to create this sort of like a, uh, how do you call it, like, like, like this propagandist um, example, right? Set the West Berlin as an example of capitalistic development versus, you know, the socialistic East Berlin. Uh, but uh, the problem is that, um, you know, later on the Soviets just built the Berlin Wall, right? So they walled off their own people, I mean, the, the East Berlin uh, people, so they couldn't see, you know, this example of capitalistic development anyway. So who could have thought, right, that the Soviets can do that? Uh, okay, you might say, well, uh, from a political point of view, it's important, right? Because Berlin is the real capital of Germany, so having it was like a major asset as like, you know, like a, basically it signified you know, the true victory in the war, etc., etc. But to this, we may respond, well, it's Germany, you know, and it's a country that is heavily regionalized and federalized, meaning decentralized, basically. So there are many capitals, just like Berlin, in a way. So Germany, in, in case you don't know, was only unified in 1870s, right? So it was a pretty young country as a country, all right? So what the hell is going on with Berlin then? Like, w w what's the case? So just like in the case of Illuminati, watch my video if you wish, link in the description, we'll need to learn some history here as well. And again, I'll link all the relevant documents, if, if, if any, actually. There probably won't be many um, in the description as well. So... Uh, let's look at some history here, right? Uh, in 1943, while the Allies were developing the Operation Overlord, right, the, uh, basically the um, uh, Normandy and, and stuff, uh, there was an additional plan in development uh, that was called Operation Rankin. R-A-N-K-I-N. Okay, so, it, and it had three cases. All right. So the case A was the, like it's like you know, you know like hypothetical scenarios, and they were developed like what should we do in this case? Basically, like a normal uh, operation of the high command. So the case A was that uh, German resistance suddenly weakens. All right, and then we start the operation Overlord earlier than planned. So basically earlier than May of 1944. Then case B is that uh, Germany withdraws from occupied territories. And finally, case C is that uh, Germany unconditionally surrenders. Then, basically, what do we do then, right? And it's under this case C, when Germany, for some whatever reason, unconditionally surrenders, uh, the Allies, like according to this Operation uh, Nankin, uh, would occupy Germany and split it into the zones of responsibility. Kind of like what actually happened later on, right? So, uh, but anyway, both Overlord and the um, Rankin uh, Plan C and just Rankin, Operation Rankin in the first place, were prepared by a British officer, Lieutenant General Frederick Morgan. He was the head of uh, so-called Cossack, uh, 
which is basically the high command of Allied Expeditionary Force. So unsurprisingly, since it was the British guy developing it, according to this plan, the Brits would get the most juicy parts of Germany. In particular, the uh, Ruhr Valley, famous for its, you know, steel and coal production. And also, like, in general, it's the most industrialized, the most, the richest part of Germany in the first place. That has been a uh, subject of debate, you might say, between Germany and France for quite a while. For many decades and even centuries, you might say. So, with all the major ports in the north uh, becoming British as well, I mean, according to this ranking case C. Uh, along with the Ruhr Valley, I mean. So, yeah, but what's important for us in this case, for, for Berlin discussion, is that it did not include Berlin at all, this Rankin plan. Uh, it was supposed to be all Soviet. So, according to this plan, the Soviet continue to advance from the east and they take over Berlin and that's it pretty much, all right? But when Roosevelt, the American president, saw the plan, he, for some reason, started peddling the idea that the Allied forces should actually enter Berlin simultaneously with the Soviets, or even earlier than the Soviets, all right? Uh, and then, so, that was kind of Roosevelt's idea fix, you might say. If there's idea fix, I don't know what's the expression in, in English. So, anyway, uh, later on, Morgan have received a more detailed plan from London, and this new plan has already included three different zones of occupation. That is the British, the American, and the Soviet, okay? And in this new plan, the Allied Berlin was already present. So, in his turn, Roosevelt, like, roughly at the same time, has made his own proposals. It was roughly in November 1943 when Roosevelt was traveling to uh, conferences in Cairo and Tehran. So, uh, these new propo proposals of Roosevelt included uh, some actually completely idiotic stuff, like, for example, he proposed the division of Germany according to religious beliefs into three zones, like there should be, a, um, uh, southwest should be a, like a Catholic zone, like northwest should be Protestant, and uh, like the east should be like Prussianist, as if it was a religion, you know. So it was uh, kind of a little bit delusional, you might say, or maybe more than a little bit. But anyway, uh, among other things, uh, there were a proposal for Britain to take over France completely. So you might see from, from this that France wasn't actually considered a, like an actor in all of this. It was just part of a Germ uh, occupy uh, the territory ger uh, occupied by Germany. I'm sorry about this. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, in Roosevelt's proposal, it was uh, the United States that should have like supposedly uh, controlled the northern parts of Germany with all the ports and with Berlin, right? Just as we've said, for some reason, Roosevelt wanted Berlin. So, but as we remember, according to Rankin plan and this other development that came afterwards, uh, the British developments, that is, the Brits wanted North as well, right? So, uh, basically, Roosevelt was saying that there would be a race for Berlin, again, for some reason, and we, the, we have to win it, we meaning the Americans, right? So, for some reason, he was so obsessed with uh, taking the capital uh, that it actually caused a lot of dismay, like a lot of disagreements in the American high command, because the American generals actually didn't understand uh, why Berlin was so important, and it actually wasn't, you know. It was just some weird thinking by the Roosevelt himself. So, yeah, uh, basically, again, the key difference, the key disagreement between the American plans proposed by Roosevelt and the British plans uh, were that who controls the north of Germany, right? So, the Americans wanted the north to themselves, and the British wanted the north to themselves, accordingly, all right? And, okay, so after the Moscow conference in November 1943, uh, European Advisory Committee was c created. So, this time with the Soviet representation, like explicitly, with a so Soviet representative there. And uh, another two guys were, well, maybe more than two guys, but like two, two other sides were British and American still. So, this com committee has continued to develop plans of splitting the Germany into occupation zones, now including the Soviet zone explicitly as a part of this sort of trilateral agreement. So, in workings of this commission, uh, I've said committee probably previously, well, it's commission, all right? Uh, the Brits have once again proposed their previous uh, plan, back from the days of Rankin development, 
but this time with joint occupation of Berlin by the Soviets, the Brits and the Americans. <clears throat> and the Soviets actually easily agreed, wink wink, we'll learn why, I mean you probably already know why if you watch my channel, uh, but uh, Americans didn't, so Americans was, were, were hesitant um, like these two, two other, the, the, the Brits and the Soviets were in agreement, but the Americans thought like, wait, wait a minute, like, what's going on? Like, something fishy is here, right? Like, we're being tricked, it seems, but we don't seem to understand why, yet, at least, alright? So, the Americans have kept resisting to these new plans and kept trying to get whatever Roosevelt wanted initially, right? So, and this back and forth continued uh, all the way until May 1944, when the Americans have finally gave up and um, given up and said that, well, okay, we agree with the British zoning, right? To which the Soviets agreed as well uh, previously. However, the Americans still did not agree on who gets which zone, right? They agreed on the zoning itself, but they still wanted the northern part, right? And it wasn't until the September of 1944 when they finally agreed, I say, okay, the British guys, like, take the north or whatever. So, yeah, you just give us the southern part and let's get over it with it. Though, uh, again, uh, Americans actually got a couple of ports in the north, Bremen in particular, with uh, obviously the rights to transit uh, stuff between their occupation zone and this port they have. Uh, so, yeah. And meanwhile, in the summer of 1944, the Soviets have proposed a more detailed plan of splitting of Berlin itself, with eastern part um, being under the Soviets and the western part under the Americans and the British. And like the Soviets say, well, you split it however you wish, we don't care. Like, you have this peace and other, other things are not our business. So all of these documents together have finally been signed by all the parties in November of 1944. Well, all the parties, excluding Germany, I assume. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, including the Soviet plan, Soviet in thick air quotes, again, wink wink, Soviet plan of splitting Berlin into parts and the British zoning proposals going all the way back to, again, this development of Operation uh, Rankin. So, the Brits eventually got what they wanted, as you can see from this. The juicy zones of Ruhr and the North and the ports, and they got the splitting of Berlin itself. Again, wink wink, we'll examine why they could have wanted to split Berlin and why was the Soviet representative, Soviet representative, who proposed the, this particular splitting. But anyway, so the Brits have succeeded, right? And they thought, well, maybe let's try to play these dumb Americans some more. So Churchill started to hype up Roosevelt and he said like, hey man, I know you really wanted Berlin, right? So, maybe just try to take it over before the Russians came, come, before the Soviets come. So, or else it might be bad, it might end bad, you know, the Soviets would take over Berlin and then later on claim, well, it was the Soviets who won the war, right? We couldn't, uh, we can't, uh, like, make this possible, right? Let's take Berlin ourselves. So, actually, like, spoiler alert, that's exactly what happened, like, the Soviets to this day still claim that it was them uh, basically achieving victory over Germany, right? And everyone else was unimportant. Uh, so yeah, uh, but the Americans didn't succumb to that provocation as their command estimated the possible losses as like at least 100,000 soldiers. Uh, not meaning dead, but like just losses, right? So I, I, that is if the Americans try to rush the Berlin, right? To try to rush into Berlin before the Soviets come. Uh, so, and that was 100,000 was a bit too much, so the generals said to, uh, generals told Roosevelt that no thanks, like, we're not, uh, we're not subscribing to this. Uh, like, for comparison, by the way, the Soviet losses uh, during the Berlin um, operation were around 600,000, not 100,000. So that was like 80,000 dead and like many hundred, like 500,000 uh, wounded and like etc. Cetera, et cetera, injured, uh, taken prisoner, uh, bloody blah. So uh, eventually Eisenhower stopped his troops uh, at the Elbe River and Churchill was furious about this. So he really wanted to incite tensions between the Americans and the Soviets, but he failed. Again, wink wink, uh, why he wanted this, these tensions to appear 
we'll discuss at the very end of this video. So even after, actually not, not too far into the future, like in a few minutes. So even after Roosevelt's death, Churchill continued to harass Truman this time, saying that, well, you know, uh, take some more of that juicy German land. Let's like, like, let's reconsider the zones maybe. So can you please make the Soviets more uncomfortable? So for example, um, there was a big chunk of, uh, territory that was de facto occupied by Americans. See, see the map. So this purple thingy was technically in the Soviet occupation zone, according to previous agreements, but uh, factually was occupied by the Americans, right? So Churchill uh, asked Truman to leave the American forces there instead of withdrawing them according to the previous agreements, all right? To basically to piss the Soviets off. But the Americans didn't buy that uh, either, right? They said, well, we're gonna like cherish the agreements, we're gonna withdraw anyway. So Churchill failed again, basically, you might say. All right, so this historical introduction was meant to demonstrate the splitting of Germany was basically, and Berlin in particular, was basically a British project from the very start. And it has succeeded as such. So the Soviets all the way through were just nodding uh, in agreement to everything the Brits were proposing. Again, unsubscribe, uh, sorry, unsurprising, <laughs> and here are all the wink winks, uh, where they condense is that uh, USSR was a British colony. Again, I've said this many times, and this is just another illustration of that, all of what I was talking about before. So the Allies didn't need Berlin. It was actually kind of harmful to take Berlin, again, because it was so deep in the Soviet territory, Soviet occupied territory. So, uh, for, again, only Roosevelt really wanted Berlin, for, again, for some personal psychopathic reasons. Like, I, I don't really know why he wanted it. But uh, the Brits have managed to lure the Americans into it, into Berlin. So, essentially, the Brits have sort of, like, attached a string to Americans, which they can pull uh, at any time, pretty much, to incite some sort of, like, pain, you might say, very vaguely. So, yeah, so Berlin was surrounded by the British ally, USSR, the British colony. So now they could incite crises in and around Berlin. They, I mean, British, uh, the, the Britain and their colony, USSR, that would directly impact the Americans, right? And I've also, by the way, omitted the part where, uh, how the French came into the picture, right? We were all t talking about only three powers uh, negotiating here, actually only two. If you uh, include the, the fact that uh, the USSR was a British colony. So, how did the French got into the picture? Well, basically the British have donated parts of their ter territory to the French, right? And the funniest part actually was that uh, the French territory was, uh, had to be resupplied and basically like financed by the Americans. <laughs> so the British have like said, okay, this is French. We don't care about this. Uh, and the Americans like, well, why am I going to pay for this all? And the British say, well, hell yes, my friend. So yeah, it was once again, the British creating prob more problems for Americans in Europe. So yeah. And uh, like, there are many, many details. Like if you have this general framework that I've just given you that the USSR is a British colony and they act in accord, uh, so you will understand the, the whole gist of it. But just as a, one funny example, all right? There was a local radio station, I mean, local Berlin-esque, I don't know, radio station, uh, Haus, de, uh, Haus des Rundfunks, it's called in German. And it was controlled by the Soviets, because the Soviets entered the city first. But according to the splitting plan, it was sitting inside the British territory, all right? inside of the British occupation zone in Berlin. So the facility has had a Berlin wall, if you wish, of its own, uh, with big signs saying like, this is not a Western radio station, beware, you know, and, and this station has only moved outside of the British zone of occupation to the Soviet zone proper in 1956. So it was all a big circus, essentially, before that and after that uh, in general in Berlin. So yeah, so the conclusions that we may arrive from all of this is that, well, well, Americans didn't really want to stay in Europe, except for Roosevelt, maybe. 
for any long period of time. They actually wanted to get into China instead. That's why I keep saying that China was the main reason, the main prize for World War II. The World War II is the war for China. The last unclaimed big chunk of uh, planet and the population of the planet, right? The colonial, uh, the, the, the juiciest colonial piece still unclaimed. So, and that was the problem for the British, that the Americans want to, want China, essentially. Because the British wanted to single-handedly control China, right? They've already demolished uh, the Austrians, the, the Germans, the French, uh, only the, Amer the Americans were the problem, right? So the main goal of the British was to drag the Americans in all sorts of trouble in Europe, including the war against Hitler, right? So they couldn't switch their attention to China, they, I mean, the Americans. So the Americans w would be too busy in Europe to uh, look um, uh, for an invasion in China, let's say, for example. And the USSR was a British colony and was used extensively to that end, to keep the Americans busy in Europe. So the Soviets were utilized by the British as this looming threat in Europe uh, that the Americans have to pay attention to and have to counteract uh, every now and then, right? So there were big, two big uh, threats in Europe. First Hitler, then possible return of Hitler or whatever, so Americans have to stay put in Europe. And the other is the big evil Stalin who can take over everything if the Americans uh, pull out of Europe, right? So the Americans were bound in Europe. They couldn't get into China because of that. I mean, they still tried, but... Um, to, uh, to, to no effect, essentially. So once again, it was all a distraction of the Americans from Asia. And one of the aspects of this game was the, that the British played was that the Americans have this enclave uh, of uh, Western Berlin or West Berlin deep within the Soviet-controlled Eastern Germany, and therefore the Soviets can poke the Americans every now and then if they become too eager in advancements into China, right? So you may notice as an example that Berlin, uh, the blockade of Berlin in 1948 and 1949 happened right before and during the Chinese Revolution and the establishment of the People's Republic of China, w which we call China today, just China, you know, in October of 1949, even though technically the Ch China proper is Taiwan, right? Ta Taiwan is the Republic of China. But today we call, what we call China is essentially a British colony. And Taiwan is an American colony, obviously. So in 19, so the blockade, so the blockade was one of the tools to distract the Americans from the communist, i.e. British revolution in China, right? Uh, then in 1961, for example, Kennedy has announced his uh, renewed interest in Vietnam, which is again another one pathway to China, potentially, as well as Korea was, right? And boom, we have 1961 Berlin crisis, right? So, my friend, you, ha you have to look at Europe, my friend. You you're not going into Asia, I'm sorry. That's what the British said. Uh, well, Americans say, well, we're still going to persist in Vietnam. And then the British say, well, well, maybe this little Cuban missile crisis would interest you a little bit more than Asia. You know, maybe maybe there's troubles right on your doorstep already, my friend. So um, hands off of China, please. And speaking of Cuba and Latin America in general, uh, the whole history of uh, 20th and 21st century there in Latin America is basically uh, the history of friendship in <laughs> like super thick air quotes between the Americans and the British. So basically Latin America is so unstable because it's a, a constant switching over the British funded and American funded regimes. So it's a constant war between the socialists, aka the British, and the nationalists, you know, aka the Americans. And that is literally it in a nutshell. That is the whole of Latin America and its politics. And that's why the regimes keep changing back and forth there. So to sum up, uh, splitting of Berlin uh, was part of the larger strategy of the British to keep the Americans out of China. And it has succeeded. And as a PS to this video, I'd note that there are a couple of other interesting cases of such exclaves or enclaves in recent history also created by the British. For example, after the World War I, Danzig, the, the free city of Danzig, 
well, free CD, became, like, it's essentially, what, what is it? It's, it's a German CD, right? Historically, culturally, etc., etc. Uh, but after World War I, the British said, well, let's give it to Poland, because why not? So essentially, it became an enclave of Germany within the Poland itself. And, as you know, or may know, it has become, formally, the reason to start World War II. So it has played its role, right? So the British, again, wanted to uh, keep the Americans out of China, and they've used this card they've had, the Danzig, right? They've baited Hitler to attack it, essentially. Yeah, and uh, so its, formal ex its existence has formally led to World War II. And another example of such British-created exclave, or enclave, in this case it's exclave, is Kaliningrad region of Russia, also created by Britain, or you might say they're calling the USSR in this case, and for now it just sits there quietly, isolated, surrounded by a few European countries, well again, for now, but again, it's a British bomb that keeps ticking. Thank you for watching, the eons are closing! If you wish to support me, please consider joining my Patreon, that is patreon.com slash philosopher, see the link in the description. Or if you have a scientific theory of your own and you'd like my help in developing it, please join my alternative science coaching program, also available through Patreon.